Good morning, everyone. We're going to start our next session, and uh, we are very pleased to have with us two people from the Department of Defense. Um, the what we have been looking at over the last several years is how the Department of Defense and its member services have really been moving very uh, ag aggressively in terms of really looking at the whole role of of renewables and efficiency in terms of improving their ability to uh, really provide essential services and uh, with regard to their bases uh, and and to their their equipment vehicles etc which has all been very very exciting to see what kind of work has been going on and and how it really is improving the mission that that the services are delivering. So we are going to hear from two people, uh, from the Army and from the Navy. We will first hear from Richard Kidd, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army for Energy and Sustainability. Richard? better now? All right. So uh, um, in terms of vehicles, uh, the Army is making investments in a rotary wing aircraft engine called the ITEP engine. It will improve fuel efficiency by 25 percent, but candidly that's not why we're investing. It also extends the range and doubles the lift. All right, so it's again about mission effectiveness. We work uh, at through TARDEC, the Tank and Automotive Research Development Center in Michigan, uh, alongside private industry to improve the fuel performance of our vehicles. This is an incremental process. And of course, the vehicle fleet, for the most part, has already been purchased. So new, uh, n you know, brand new build vehicles are, are not really an option. But how can we get incremental improvement on our vehicles through, uh, through um, reduced friction and better performance. On our non-tactical vehicles here uh, domestically, we've reduced our petroleum consumption by uh, almost a third, 32 and a half percent in three years. That's well ahead of the federal mandates and we've done that just through sound vehicle management, uh, fleet management practices and increased efficiency on, on our vehicles. Uh, on our domestic, on our basing, the third component, uh, on our um, Tactical bases in Iraq and Afghanistan, approximately uh, 70 to 80 percent of convoy uh, uh, 
resupply convoy weight was either fuel or water. Of the fuel, 50% of that went to, pa to produce electricity in generators. And of that fuel, approximately 50% was unnecessary. It was either lost through inefficiencies or poor power management. So uh, in the last two years in Afghanistan, we have gone through and we have deployed tactical microgrids and power management systems in every single one of the Army forward operating bases and combat outposts. And we've made the case not so much on fuel saved or even the dollar value of the fuel. What we've made the case on is the amount of soldiers returned to the fight. Soldiers and aircraft and helicopters that are not involved in the resupply mission can be applied to the primary mission, which is fighting and, and engaging the Taliban. So we are able to calculate uh, the deployment of these systems in terms of the return on combat power. We've also deployed a hybrid renewable uh, energy power systems uh, in our tactical locations, which is basically a generator, a PV panel, and a battery paired together. And we use this to power um, communications gear and um, electronic sensors that require high quality power. So the, uh, the power actually comes from the battery and the PV charges the battery. When the PV is insufficient, then the generator kicks on and operates at optimal uh, loading, charges the battery, and then cuts off. Domestically, uh, the, the U.S. Army has a very large and robust renewable energy project pipeline. I think it may be the largest in the country. We've got 240 plus megawatts of projects out in some form of procurement uh, for our installations here on the United States. The intent is that all of the power produced by these renewables will go into the Army uh, uh, to the Army installation to enhance our energy security at a substation or a microgrid on the facility. Quickly, you know, just for this building, there were some questions during the hearing season. And I just want to be very clear and correct the, correct the record that some, some members of Congress, sub, you know, uh, sub put forth the notion that the Army was paying billions of dollars for renewables that we were not paying for our uh, combat forces and our training. That's, that's a false proposition. The Army has a utility bill, all right? We're gonna pay 35 plus billion dollars on our utilities over the next 25 years. All, well, how we are paying for our renewable energy projects is we are taking a portion of that utility bill, bringing it forward with private sector partner, making the capital investments needed today and paying that back over time. All of our renewable energy projects are at or below grid parity. Let me say that again. They are at or below grid parity. This will save the Army hundreds of millions of dollars over the life of these projects. So uh, the notion that we are sacrificing readiness for renewable power is absolutely wrong. All right? We are using renewable power to build readiness. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll stop there. And I've got two minutes left if there's any questions. And That's fine. we'll go real quick. You take a, is a, are there one or two questions for uh, for Richard? Okay. Uh, Tom Sunchak for the British Embassy. Uh, are there any opportunities that you all have seen in technology transfer? Uh, there are opportunities you all have seen for technology transfer to the private sector and taking some of the lessons learned, for example, microgrids, base management, that kind of thing, uh, and moving those to uh, other sorts of uh, civilian deployment. So, so great question. And let's, so, so let's, th there's a, another proposition that's often heard in this town is, you know, the military is going to drive this huge technological change. And people uh, come up with a few examples of Kevlar and whatever the case may be. We are not going to drive technological change in the renewable energy space or the energy management space unless it furthers our mission. All right, so I have all sorts of firms that come to me and say, please just give us $30 million for our first factory. The military, at least the Army, is not a venture capital uh, site for new development or new project management, unless it contributes to our mission. So the only area where the Army is making upfront S&T, R&D type investments is in soldier power. So ideally, we'd like to increase the power density of the batteries on our soldier and go to wireless induction power transfer. So the soldier just walks into the vehicle or to a tent 
or to a space and their battery gets charged up and then they're able to power their peripherals without wires or connections. Lots of S&T there, some S&T in the vehicle and, 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 and engine space. Where we do microgrids and other things, we do this in cooperation with private industry. So the, the, the knowledge that is built from joint programs like the Spiders program where the Army, Navy, and Air Force are working together, th that's out there and it, it becomes an industry standard. Our intent would be to develop a plug and play mechanism for microgrids, just like if you connect peripherals to your computer, you plug in a generator, the microgrid automatically knows and adjusts, you plug in a light set, you plug in a coffee pot, you plug in a missile, it, it all just sort of uh, uh, seamlessly meshes together. And, and we think that's where the military wants to go, and uh, we're, we're working with our industry partners in that regard. Great. Thank Richard. Thank you very much, Richard. And we'll now turn to our other person from defense. And that's why it's so, I, I think it's so interesting to, to see how much work is being done across the services in terms of coordination and, um, and all of the exciting things that are really going on that actually make it better, safer, much more efficient for our soldiers on the ground. Um, and our next speaker is Captain James Gaudreau, who is the Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Energy. Welcome. Carol, thank you very much. Um, and certainly thank you to all of you for some, taking some time out of what I know is always a busy day in this town. Every day is a busy day in this town. Uh, the message to take away from the Navy's perspective uh, is very much the same that Richard just talked about. This is about capability. We have a mission to go forth. And when you talk about the Navy and what our enduring mission is, it's keeping the sea lanes open. When you take a look at numbers, and they vary a little bit depending upon who you talk to, 80% of the world's population lives within several hundred miles of the coast, and 90% of the goods that come into our country that help fuel our economy are brought in over the ocean. Our job is to keep those lines of communication and those sea lanes open. In order to do that, we have to be there. We have to be there consistently. We have to be there every single day before something happens. And so in order to do that, we have to operate forward. So if you take a look at the, the Chief of Naval Operations tenants, what he tells us as warfighters, what he tells us as staff in the Navy, he says, warfighting is always going to come first in everything we do. And in order to do that, we have to operate forward and we have to be ready. And from our perspective, energy is certainly an operational element to every single one of those tenants. We can't do our mission unless we have secure, reliable, ready sources of energy for our ships, for our aircraft, for our bases, for our expeditionary forces. We simply can't do it. Um, the ability that we have to deploy given an energy-dense liquid fuel is incredible. We have been able to establish our role as the dominant Navy in the world on the back of oil. We have sustained it on the back of oil, but oil will not always be there. And so it's certainly in our best interest to, one, shepherd those scarce resources in a way that's effective and that's mindful while we have access to that, and also decrease our consumption, become more efficient, get more effective use of that oil, become more mindful of how we consume it, where we consume it, and for what purpose, and also to diversify sources of our energy, both ashore and afloat. So if you take a look at what we do, we've got 285 ships and about 3,700 aircraft out there in the world, and we use about 30 million barrels of fuel each year for training and operations across the Navy and the Marine Corps. So in practical terms, that equates to roughly 1.25 billion gallons a year. 1.25 billion gallons of fuel that we have to procure, store, distribute, and deliver to that warfighter wherever they may be. And that's really what drives our concern. There are risks to that supply chain, whether they're fiscal or physical. And so certainly the volatility of the market impacts us. Every time we see a $1 increase in a barrel of oil, that's a $30 million increase in what we have to pay in a given year for purchases off the market. Every time we spend more money from a predetermined budget on fuel, that means there are less parts that we can buy less maintenance we can perform, less training we can schedule and execute. So there's definitely an impact on readiness. But more importantly, every single one of those gallons has to be delivered to that warfighter. And we operate all over the world in the middle of the oceans. And it's incredibly complex. It's challenging. It's taxing. And it's dangerous even in peacetime. We take two ships that are larger than 
many buildings, and we put them 120 to 150 feet apart for five hours steaming in one direction. Even if no one's shooting at you, that's an incredibly dangerous evolution every single time we do that. And during combat and during normal operations, every time we do that, that's four to five hours that those ships are no longer active combat assets. Everything that we can do to delay the amount of time, to reduce the amount of time we're replenishing with fuel, or delay the time in between, means that those are usable combat assets for the commander. If you take a look at what that means in combat, our Marines ashore, um, between the, the casualties in convoys and the load on an individual Marine or sailor who is an expeditionary sailor, and Richard referred to this, you know, Colonel Jim Cayley, who runs the Expeditionary Energy Office for the Marine Corps, will tell you that before the uh, war in Afgh Afghanistan started, they carried about 40 pounds on their pack. Now they carry between 20, uh, 120 and 140. And between 70 and 90 pounds of that load is water and batteries. By being able to be more efficient and use renewables and harvest that energy in the field, we can potentially drop that load for the Marine Corps by 60 pounds. That's a tremendous increase in agil agility, flexibility, and lethality. We're doing this for capability. If you take a look at the impact in combat operations for the Navy, just take a look at history. World War II, whether it's the Atlantic or the Pacific, clear lessons about what the vulnerability to a supply chain will do. Our operational commanders at that point in time made choices because of limited availability of fuel. We can't afford to get ourselves in that same situation. And I will tell you, that certainly is a big vulnerability for us. We have to continue to become more efficient, more mindful, and change our culture and how we consume the fuel in order to turn what is today a vulnerability for us into an operational advantage against our potential opponents. We do that through a mixture of technology, partnerships, and culture change. And whether the technology is a passive technology, like putting a stern flap onto a ship, which changes the hydrodynamic flow over the hull and can save anywhere from 3 to 5% of the fuel burned each year just by being on that hull, or something more active like a hybrid electric drive, which we, we've installed alternate auxiliary propulsion systems in the USS Macon Island, USS America, and they'll be going into the Arleigh Burke class destroyers. An HED on an Arleigh Burke class destroyer can give us 11 extra days at sea per year without buying or delivering a single extra drop of fuel. 11 days of steaming that I don't have to worry about how to get that to the warfighter. That's capability. That's presence. That's the mission that we have. There's no single silver bullet. There's an entire range of technology and approaches, awareness, culture change, and education. So we're certainly pursuing wide partnerships across a range of organizations. Um, we talk with a number of organizations on any given day. Uh, much like Richard said, we, we aren't necessarily investing in individual companies. But where we see promising technology that can be applied, if it's early development, we'll partner with the Office of Naval Research, who is our sci science and technology development branch, and we'll take a look at that. We'll work with academic institutions, and we'll bring companies in for prototypes, for uh, different options to take a look at it. Ashore, resiliency, and continued operations are important for us as well. Uh, distributed generation, we think, is the way that we need to move forward. And we're heavily influencing um, the discussion to lead towards third-party financing in our ashore resiliency, efficiency, uh, energy efforts. Um, we are not going to invest, invest a lot of money up front. And, and you're absolutely right. There's a misconception that we're putting a lot of money into clean energy and technology. Instead, we're leveraging third-party financing and, in many cases, saving millions of dollars over the course of years for the U.S. Navy that we can then apply to maintenance and training and development of our troops. If you really were to think about this, it's just common sense. Whatever is in the tank of the ship is what's available to that operational commander on any given day. If I can allow them to stay on station longer, if I can allow a ship to be able to do their mission or do an additional mission, if I can allow an aircraft to stay on station in support of the Marines, then that's a benefit to us. Um, we certainly don't see this as an imperative 
driven by any single other reason than capability. Simple example that I'll close with is that if we increase the efficiency for our aircraft in a carrier air wing, then we may be able to, say between 5 to 10 percent, we can return as many as 3 to 5 aircraft back into that strike sortie that the operational commander can use for a mission instead of just using them to refuel other aircraft. It's about putting the warfighter back in the fight, keeping them in the fight, and being mindful of how, where, and when we use our energy to most effect. Thank you. Oh, and also, in case you want to get uh, a little bit more information, we've got a sheet at the table outside that has some of that summarized, as well as contact information for us. Okay, that is great. Thank you so much, because I think that there is so much that people just don't realize, just don't know, and that this is a really important way to start to get that information out. And, um, and I think it's very, very exciting in terms of all the things that we're seeing. And as you said, how important common sense is in terms of thinking about how to do things better that's going to enhance so many, so many things and give us so many different benefits. So we look forward to working with you and to try and get more and more of these stories, examples out how uh, the Department of Defense, the Department of Navy, in terms of looking at, at both how you're doing on fuels and, for example, your story about the 11 days at sea extra. Unbelievable. That's just terrific. So thank you very, very much.